So welcome everybody to another episode of Sand Hill Road. And I'm super excited to have another guest here with me today, Kyle Louis, who's a partner at DCM. Kyle, are you ready to take it from the top? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. So, so Kyle, where does this podcast find you today? Uh, I am at home in San Francisco, Soma, where I have been for most of the pandemic. Um, and this is mostly the view that people see. So I try to keep it green because it brings people joy. Has it been like this all through the pandemic or has it become greener during the pandemic? Oh, it's definitely become greener. Folks on my team are like, oh, I have the pleasure of like seeing when Kyle first got the plants and then they're like been growing over the last year. Yeah. Love it. So maybe for the audience, give us the cliff notes of who you are, the TLDR. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll keep it short. I know VCs always say that and don't keep it short. I'll, I'll try to actually keep this initial intro very short. So I started my career at a firm called Pantheon doing private equity secondaries, spent a few years doing that. Uh, that brought me out to Asia. I was in Asia for a few years and went to business school. It was in business school that I started my first company, graduated, started my second company. That company, uh, Choice Pass, ended up getting acquired by Salesforce. And then I spent a couple of years at Salesforce as a product manager and about seven years ago joined DCM initially as a principal and then promoted to partner at DCM. I lead a lot of our early stage B2B and consumer investments for North America. So yeah. Let's start out with DCM. It was originally started as a firm called Doll Capital Management. So DCM is one of those few firms that can really claim to have a long track record, both in the US and in Asia. It was started, I think, about 25 years ago. Yeah, DCM was started in 96 by Dixon Dahl and David Chow. Dixon was an early partner at Excel um, in the 80s. He started the industry first telecom fund. And then in the mid 90s, decided to spin off and start his own firm called Dahl Capital. And he was actually one of uh, David's angel investors for David's last company and, and got David to, to join him to be founding partner at, at DCM. And the firm initially started off focused on telecom, internet infrastructure, cybersecurity, semiconductor, all of the kind of key areas of tech in the in the late 90s. You know, because of David's background, we started investing in Asia very early, probably amongst the first Silicon Valley firms to be to be active in Asia. The history behind Dog Capital, if you look back to the mid 90s, there's probably like a tenth, maybe a hundredth the number of firms that there are today. And so Dog Capital was definitely one of the kind of old school, like established firms, been around for a while. I mean, we're on our 14th fund, but about 10 years ago, uh, really kind of moved to be truly global. So Silicon Valley firm that was investing in Asia to be a kind of globally distributed partnership before that term was a thing and also moved very actively into application, software layer, consumer internet, generalist technology. So those have been the key changes over the last decade. And I joined as part of like the next generation of, of partners finding that next generation. So, yeah. And I think the fund you're currently investing out of is a recent fund that, that was announced, actually two funds who raised 880 million last year. I think it was 780 for your flagship fund. And then you also have a 100 million seed fund. Maybe talk a little bit about these different funds. Where does the seed fund end? Is it at series A? And also a little bit about the regional allocation of these funds. Yeah, absolutely. I call it our global seed fund three. The official name of it is actually the A fund, which the, the term actually comes from Android. So it's Android fund one, uh, fund two, fund three. The genesis behind that actually was the Android ecosystem, right? As mobile was starting to, to take off, you know, another firm in the Valley had the iFund around the iPhone. And so we thought, hey, um, given our ties to Asia, good relationships, with a lot of Asian corporates, Android is the dominant ecosystem in Asia and around the world. And so we started the iFund. So that was the initial focus. And it's since evolved to be a you know, global seed fund. The first fund was 65 million invested in companies like Kakao. And then we raised the second fund you know, that invested in companies like Lime 
And then now we're on our global seed fund um, three, which is a hundred million dollar fund. That is majority invested in the U.S. We're doing much more at the earlier stages in, in the U.S. than we are in China. And then our main venture fund, our flagship fund is a $780 million fund. That's actually the largest fund we've ever raised. Historically, our funds have been between three and 500 million, and we've kept it intentionally small. This last fund, just with the, the overall kind of market evolution, we decided to raise a slightly larger fund. That fund is actually now majority investing in China and the U.S. being kind of the second largest area that we look at, and then uh, Japan and then the rest of the world. Interesting. I mean, with the 780 million fund, one could have also thought about, you know, raising a separate growth fund, but you've decided to sort of keep it in one vehicle, right? And then reserve maybe maybe a larger portion of the fund to later stage rounds. Um, but it's definitely interesting how, how this has shaped out. Maybe let's talk a little bit about differentiation, which is always a big topic in venture, right? As I mentioned, you're really one of the few firms that can really claim to have a long track record in, in both the US and, and Asia. I remember this episode from acquired podcast i don't know if you've been a listener but there was doug leone from sequoia who talked about you know setting up the sequoia china offices and it was all very much an expansion mode to asia do you feel that it gives you a key advantage to be sort of global natively giving you an advantage in like seeing some tech trends earlier maybe bringing companies to the u.s or the other way around i think it is a competitive advantage for us i think that managing a globally distributed investment team with on the ground people in different time zones and geographies is not an easy thing to do. And I think that we've managed to do that really well. And it's kind of part of our secret sauce, like what's the right level of not in person now, but traditionally in person, you know, collaboration on, on deals, given that, you know, we're focused on different geographies. And so I think that we do a particularly good job of that because it's in our DNA. In terms of trends, for the first 10 years when we were investing in Asia, a lot of the advantage was really in the knowledge arbitrage from the U.S. innovation going to China. So what are the latest trends in the U.S. and what are the things that are relevant for China? The last five to eight years, we've seen information transfer both ways in which we're seeing a particularly on the consumer internet side, social, e-commerce, payments, and some parts of kind of applied AI, we're seeing China really leapfrog the U.S. And uh, we're seeing a lot of trends happen there at the same time or even earlier than the U.S. And so there's a lot of learnings from our U.S. team. It's super interesting how you talk about this dynamic shifting from the last couple of decades. And I've just recently started listening to this Tech Bus Asia podcast and learned so many concepts that aren't really around in the U.S., for example, group buying. It's quite interesting how, how this concept may apply in the U.S. as well. Mutual pollination of ideas and, and concepts. And the Japan angle, which is, you know, I think quite unique to us, Japan as a venture market is much smaller than the US and China, but from a tech and IT spend perspective, is the third largest market after the US and China. And so it's a very strategic market for us. And the Japan team, because there's a relatively shallower venture capital base, especially those are kind of Silicon, that operate Silicon Valley, they get the advantage of the knowledge arbitrage from both the US and China. And so in the Japanese market, we actually do a lot of incubations. Um, we're invested in a company called Free. We were the founding investors. We worked with them from day one to start that company. And, you know, that's now a four and a half billion dollar publicly traded company on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Free, um, for those that are not familiar, is a combination of an online QuickBooks plus kind of payroll, all roll into one for SMBs in Japan. Maybe let's talk about the recent role that DCM has been on. And you mentioned in a, in a recent interview that your firm has generated a 61 GMOIC on the investments that have gone public in the recent two years. And that's just spectacular. You mentioned one deal in particular, the Kaishu, which was a 260 GMOIC transaction, which really puts it on par with really the, the biggest of the biggest Excel's Facebook transaction, Sutter Hills Snowflake transaction. This has been a crazy ride in the last couple of 
or the yeah. last um, two years, I would say. You mentioned companies like Bill.com, but also Hims and Hers. Maybe talk a little bit just about the recent role that you've been on. Yeah, we've had eight companies go go public or announce that they're going public um, just in the last six, seven months alone. A number of them happened in Q4, Q1. Ones like um, SoFi and, and Matterport have announced their SPAC mergers and will go public in, in, in the next month or two. It's been a fa fantastic ride for us. And I, I like to joke that, you know, it's like a 10 year overnight success, you know, things that we've been really working on really over the last decade, it, it really kind of showed fruition now. I'd say the biggest winner by far is a company in China called Kwai Show. For folks that are not familiar, is actually the largest live stream company in China in terms of transaction volume on the virtual goods side. They are the second largest in terms of user base after TikTok, and uh, they're publicly traded in in Hong Kong with a uh, you know market cap in the hundred and. 30 to 150 billion dollar range. And we're the largest international VC in, in that company. But we've had a number of other um, exits in, in the US recently, ranging from, I sort of mentioned Matterport, Bill.com, Kim's and Hers, Shift Cars, uh, Fubo TV. So it's a pretty diverse group. And then a few on the MA side as well. Rike, which was acquired by, by Citrix for, for $2.3 billion in January of this year. And then Docsend, um, where, where I was on the board, which was recently acquired by, by Dropbox. Wow. It's just an amazing, it's an amazing ride. And it's another overnight success, 10 years in the making. And if you get to this harvesting phase of a fund, it's always great to see the liquidity events rolling in like this. But maybe let's now take a step back. One thing I found extremely interesting about your background is you have a lot of venture capitalists who claim to have seen both sides of the table, having been a founder and then becoming a venture capitalist, but you've actually seen all three sides of the table because venture capital really sits between founders, serving founders first and foremost. On the other side, they're also serving LPs. And you've been on the LP side with Pantheon. I think your last role was as a head of Asia Pacific doing secondaries and direct co-investments. Maybe talk a little bit about the opaque world of LP investing yeah, thank you for the question. And yeah, I don't get this question a lot. Started my career on the LP side. A lot of my friends were going into investment banking. I was a little more contrarian and said there's this analyst program at Pantheon, a uh, tier program similar to, to banking, but it was doing private equity secondaries, which at the time was a super niche industry. It's essentially buying portfolios of um, venture capital and private equity stakes from other limited partners. But as part of that side, also really saw the primary fund investment side. We, at that time, had recently started co-investments. After two years, I was promoted to an associate and moved to Asia to help expand Pantheon's Asia franchise. And I had a fantastic time. I mean, it was a very lean team, really building up the, the franchise in Asia. I covered you know, Japan down to Australia, India, China, um, being based out of Hong Kong during the, the really like the boom of 2006 to 2000, mid 2008, and then the bust of like 2008, 2009. And so seeing that cycle was, was really valuable. And then after that, I, I came back to the US and went to Harvard Business School. And uh, it was really at, at HBS. And I think there's a common misconception that you know MBAs are not entrepreneurial. I, I was part of the now quite well-known class of 2011, where, you know, we entered in 2009, which means we applied to business school in 2008. The founders of my class include the founders of Grab, Gojek, Stitch Fix, Figs, Copang, Oscar, Rescale, uh, actually Russ from Docsen was a classmate of mine. And the list goes on and on. I think in, in venture and actually in life, like a lot of it is about timing. And I think that it just so happened that, you know, we were coming out of the great financial crisis. The mobile was starting to really take off. In hindsight, it was a fantastic time to start a company. You don't know that until years later. And so I did not go on the you know, start my career at Pantheon thinking that I would end up being a VC or that I would end up starting a company. I mean, I was just thinking, hey, for the first couple of years, this is a great, great firm and a great program and I can, I can learn finance and investing. Yeah, that's, I think that's, that's super interesting that it, it has given you probably, it has shaped your perspective on how do LPs view us. It's great to have seen both sides, I guess. Now let's talk a little bit about Choice Pass. Choice Pass 
it was an, an early enterprise SaaS company. If I understand it correctly, you were helping employees to discover and redeem company-sponsored perks. Maybe talk a little bit about what you were trying to accomplish there. We, we raised a seed round from some great seed funds and, and angel investors. We were in the process of raising our Series A, spoke to a few folks, including Salesforce. At the time, Salesforce was really looking to expand their HR cloud and had recently acquired a company in Canada called Ripple. And there were some functionality around rewards and recognition side that they were looking to expand. And so... Uh, we really looked at the acquisition by Salesforce as a continuation of our vision. There were a lot of features actually that we built at Choice Paths that were really around tying recognition to real world rewards in, in a way that's kind of like an early kind of fintech. So some of the key features that we built was the ability for the democratization of rewards. So non quota carrying people to get incentivized and rewarded for closing sales. As part of that, the ability for people to spend those rewards on their personal credit cards and get credit resettled automatically, integrating with some of the early APIs of like First Data. So it's sort of like actually more like an early fintech company, but it was before the days of, of fintech. So we we're software. Yeah. Financial software. Yeah. And then you you spent some time at, at Salesforce before you made your way to DCM. And maybe talking a little bit, I think it's quite interesting for people to learn how starting out at a venture firm really works. You mentioned you had a great network of founders from Harvard Business School. Today, we have this notion of the career venture capitalist. You definitely weren't one of them, but we have these people who join as associates, you know, really work on the top of the funnel talking to a lot of companies, moving on to become a principal, you know, taking more ownership in the IC and the decision-making process. And then last but not least, making your way to, to partner. But I think it's quite difficult for people to understand how, you know, how, how this transition really works. A lot of, you know, people come in as partners after having done a lot of angel investing. Maybe talk a little bit about these five years um, before becoming a partner. Yeah, absolutely. I, I joined DCM as a principal. Principals at DCM are fairly senior, can you know sponsor and, and lead deals and sit on board, even more true, obviously, at the partner level. You know, D DCM is a very traditional way of looking at titles. You know, at DCM, a, a principal is a partner in training, come in and you're building trust both internally as well as with founders and portfolio companies. And as you start to build a track record, then you're promoted to a partner. And I think that over the last, you know, five plus years, a lot of venture firms have moved to giving essentially everybody partner title. So it's unclear who are check writing, sponsoring partners who can sit on boards and who are folks that are, you know, doing deal sourcing, but may not necessarily be able to write their own checks. And so that's not how DCM works. It's true that like as a, as a principal, like, you know, you're not at the highest levels. And so there's a lot of trust that needs to be built. There's more mid-level within a venture firm and winning deals and sourcing great deals and having promising companies is a really important part of, of getting promoted. Before joining DCM, did you do some angel investing? I did start angel investing while I was at Salesforce, but it was not for the intention of moving into venture. I was doing it because I had been an entrepreneur before and I had deep founder empathy and I would meet companies with like great founders or problems that I was passionate about. And I was like, oh, I'm interested in, in investing. And because of having been a former founder, when there's sort of like other founders, particularly at the time, like more enterprise because I was at Salesforce, I would get a lot of deal flow. And so I would introduce a lot of VC firms that I knew from the time that I was an entrepreneur and introduce them to a lot of VCs. And so I guess that was things that VCs look for. That wasn't necessarily, you know, the reason I did it. And the whole moving into venture thing was in my mind, actually moved from what I had intended on doing, because I was really kind of focused on starting my next company after Salesforce. Yeah, um, I wonder what the blended return would have been if you had just blindly invested in all your classmates at Harvard Business School. It would have probably been the, the best return. It would returning. have been amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even better than DCM's recent returns, I think. It's, uh, I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> quite impressive, the list. Okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about some recent deals. And I mentioned at the top of the show that I had one of your founders and, as I just learned, classmates from Harvard Business School on Russ Heddleston from Docs who had a great exit just recently, two or three weeks after being on my show to Dropbox. And 
I remember that Russ told me during the interview that actually the round from DCM on Crunchbase, it looks like it was a bridge round, but it was actually a pretty competitive round. It might have had something to do with you having a good and deep running connection with, with Russ before, but maybe talk a little bit about this round, about being part of this great journey with Dachshund. So Russ and I have known each other since business school. I was really making the transition to tech and he was, you know, somebody that studied computer science at Stanford and then worked at Microsoft and then interned at Dropbox and uh, started a company that was, you know, acquired by Facebook. And so he really kind of helped me just understand tech more when we were in in business school. And then I, and then I started the company and then he was at Facebook. And so he was at a big company and you know, I was, I, I was starting a company. And when he decided to leave Facebook and start Docsend, he had approached me as at Salesforce at the time, talked about the idea. We kind of, you know, brainstormed things and, you know, stayed in touch really through the years. And then when I became a VC, you know, I, I'd always been interested in, in Docsend. They were starting to really break out, but the company is very capital efficient. They were not like in need of additional capital. They had gotten term sheets, you know, at much larger rounds. And ultimately the reason it was 5 million and DCM was the only check in there. So the existing investors couldn't get their parada because it was a formula of like trying to get as much ownership as we could, given that the company didn't need a lot of cash. And so we actually gave them the option to raise much more and we wanted to put more money in, but like they didn't need it. And in the end, they were right because they didn't touch the money that we put into the company for 18 months. So crazy. He's such a Pegasus. I, I told him on my show, he's such a Pegasus. It felt like he was bootstrapping on, on an A for years. He's an amazing founder. I mean, Doxon wasn't actively looking to sell. The business was cranking well. It was profitable. It was, it was growing nicely and the growth was accelerating. You know, ultimately, I think there was a lot of shared vision with Dropbox. They, they had other acquisition offers as well previously and also, you know, competitive to, to Dropbox. And ultimately, we like to pride ourselves as being very much a founder friendly, very founder friendly and supportive of what the founders want to do. And ultimately, thought they thought it was the right move. And so we're supportive of it. Yeah. And, and yeah, it was a great outcome for, for everybody. But yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, the next company Rust start, it'll be a billion dollar company. So. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> either. Maybe let's talk about another company. And if I think about this spectrum of being like hyper capital efficient versus being like capital intensive, I couldn't imagine a company that is more capital intensive than Lime, which had, has been in the yeah. midst of the micro mobility scooter wars. And yeah. you've been really part of this journey very early on, you know, coming into the first, I think, institutional round with Andreessen Horowitz. I mean, we invested with Brad and Toby when it was just a PowerPoint and a pilot program with a dozen bikes in Seattle. And it was really about, you know, our learnings from the the China market and what was working and what was working. We didn't end up investing in any of the bike share companies in China, but there's a lot of learnings there. When initially Lime Bike came out, it was like, this can definitely work. Uh, there are a few different dynamics here. Number one is much higher willingness to pay. Also, the general competition was really more of these public-private partnerships and these kind of bike share companies that were pretty kind of old school, not using a lot of technology. And so we were really excited about the vision and the founders. And, and then the micro-mobility movement just took off. And so it was really this roller coaster from, you know, the huge peaks and then the troubles that sort of started really, you know, like, honestly, uh, a bit before COVID, but certainly COVID was a huge factor as well. Lime had to shut down 95% of their markets because of the shelter in place around the world. There was also this vision that Lime was going to be a global company, and that they were starting in the US, but we very quickly realized that the European market is super attractive because of the infrastructure that had already been built up and the usage of, you know, bikes and bikes and scooters. And, so, you know, I'm still a huge believer in the micro mobility movement. I think, you know, one of Lime's key competitors just announced uh, they're going public through a SPAC. And while I can't like disclose the Lime numbers, you know, they are materially larger than than bird so um, i'm excited to kind of see what happens with the company going forward so maybe let's talk about a last transaction 
which is really combining a couple of trends, telemedicine with direct-to-consumer, hims and hers. If I think about the why now slide for this company, I think an important fact is that the Viagra patent expired by the end of April 2020, which really created this opportunity for direct-to-consumer companies to move into this space and tackle this niche problem and that very few people like to talk about establishing itself as a lifestyle brand, putting this positive spin on it. I think the company's backed in Q1 of this year. Talk a little bit about Hims and Hers. What's the story behind it? How are you involved? Yeah, the Hims and Hers investment is is a little bit of an atypical investment for us. Like 82% of the capital that we invest is at the early stages as we define C to Series B. And Hims was a little bit late, later than that, but we saw just tremendous upside. Andrew is an incredibly compelling founder. The retention on the products, the, the profile of the user base was incredibly appealing. And so we saw tremendous upside even in a growth round. And um, you know the company went public recently. We continue to be shareholders. We continue to see the upside even as a you know as a public company. There's a common mis- misconception that companies like Hims burn a ton of cash. But now that their financials are public, you can see that they're actually very cash efficient. I think the year prior to going public, they burned something like $10 million collectively for 2020. You know, it's a model that I think uh, has been replicated in other parts of the world now. There's been a lot of vertical solutions in direct-to-consumer, vertical telemedicine, which have come about. But, you know, I'd say Kim's was really one of the early pioneers in combining telemedicine with the prescription side and the ongoing kind of delivery of, of the medications, combining that also with building a lifestyle brand that people feel good to be associated with. And so I continue to be very bullish on the company. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's there's been a lot of talk about the, the digitally native vertical brands and, and direct to consumer brands that they're spending a ton of cash on, you know, CAC and really having really difficult unit economics when it comes to scale. What I think is interesting about hims and hers, you still have this friction of the prescription. So customers, even if you drive traffic directly to the site, there's still some level of friction. Maybe talk a little bit about how you thought about this. Well, people are going on to these sites because they have a problem, right? They've heard about, you know, hims or hers or others as a online solution to solve their problem. You know, we're investors in Muesli, which is a online telemedicine solution for dermatology, specifically focused on, you know, anti-aging melasma and other kind of skin conditions. They're doing tremendously well. There's a lot of people who have issues with their skin and they hear about Muesli, they hear that they have, you know, interesting compounded, you know, solutions, you know, medical grade requires a prescription. And so I think that market is only going to continue to grow. I think one part of our thesis around investing uh, in Hims and in Muesli and also a company called Tempo, which is a digitally native AI driven fitness studio, which launched during COVID. Key here is the consumer subscription part, just like the move from client server to SaaS led to a lot of, you know, the evolution of an entirely new, now massive category in enterprise software. Um, The same thing is happening in consumer, whereas, you know, five, 10 years ago, it was all about that individual transaction, getting economics to work. And then if the users come back, then that's all gravy for you. But you have to make the economics work on the very first transaction. With consumer subscription, there's an ongoing relationship with customers. You want to keep them happy over time. And so a lot of these companies that we invest in have a kind of ongoing subscription component to it, which makes the economics much more appealing. You think about repeat purchases for erectile dysfunction, it's definitely on the higher LTV compared to, let's say, <laughs> let's say leggings or crop tops. And so as we're running against the clock, talk to us a little bit about where people can find out more about you and what you're up to. I am proud to say that I spend a lot of time with entrepreneurs, with the founders of my portfolio, with the execs. So I don't have a lot of time to like tweet or post things, but I am uh, very responsive on, on LinkedIn and the things that I post on, on LinkedIn. We also have a Medium page where we talk about some of our latest thinkings. We are planning to start being more active on, on Twitter, but particularly around just insights, um, sort of like snackable data trends that we're seeing, especially from a global lens. And so that will be coming out soon around around sort of like 
DCM, but the areas that I'm really excited about and spending a lot of time on, I'd say the two key areas, FinTech, next generation FinTech applications, I'm really interested in embedded lending where you can leverage the existing customer bases of you know, software providers or, or B2B marketplaces to provide fintech solutions to their end customers. I've been spending a lot of time at the intersection of healthcare and software, which is an evolution that DCM has been focused on for a number of years now. And then also anything touching software in the e-commerce vertical, because I think it's only going to continue to explode from here with the behavior changes that we've seen with COVID. And you personally, your main focus is on the SEED program, if I understand correctly. You're head of the, the SEED program and the SEED fund. So DCM was a very lean team. We have 18 investment professionals globally. We have four key investors in the US, including myself, covering all sectors from enterprise software, consumer, digital health, and fintech. And so we have a very broad mandate uh, and there's a lot of surface area. So my focus is on C to series B, I'd say amongst that, the sweet spot actually is series A, but I, uh, with the, uh, with the recent market activities, that's kind of driven us to move a little bit earlier stage. We spend a lot of time at the seed stage these days, probably not the first round, like the angel or seed round, but we do spend a lot of time at the institutional seed round where companies are raising, call it two to four or five million. Yeah, that's great. And it's it's the most time intensive phase of the company where, where the founders need the most handholding. And it's great to hear that you're not spending too much time on Twitter because a lot of people on Twitter, VC Twitter, it seems they, they have the feeling that if you get to 20,000 followers, you automatically get a job at, at a VC firm. <laughs> um, so it's, it's great to see that you're really focusing on, on the founders and, and really making sure that you're supporting them first and foremost. So yeah, yeah Kyle. Kyle, thank you so much for taking the time and being with us here today. Yeah, thank you for the great questions. And I really enjoyed this interview. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, to staying in touch.